Ich finde besonders spannend. I'm especially interested in the interaction between substances from our environment, like nutrients, and the body's own regulation of certain signaling pathways, where the world of peptides and steroids meets the world of nutrition, the impact of stress and the impact of movement. And it's at this molecular interface that we're trying to identify specific patterns that are very, very important for the brain, patterns it can recognize and respond to with appropriate signals und mit den entsprechenden Signalen reagiert. Wenn man also das Gehirn so, if you want to tell the brain to cooperate in its systematic control of all metabolic pathways, so that it inhibits diseases like diabetes or obesity, you have to understand these patterns better and try to imitate the crucial signals. Und die entscheidenden Signale versuchen zu imitieren. Matthias Chöp is a medical researcher and an internationally recognized capacity in the field of metabolic disorders. He focuses on the molecular transduction mechanisms that play a role in diabetes and obesity and on new approaches to prevention and therapy. Professor Chöp has relocated from the University of Cincinnati to the Technische Universität München, TUM. The reason for the move was the Alexander von Humboldt professorship. He is the first medical scientist to be granted the award and he wants to make TUM and the Helmholtz Center Munich leading institutions for research into diabetes type 2. I think the wonderful thing about this Alexander von Humboldt professorship is that it gives you freedom, academic freedom, to dedicate yourself to your visions and hopefully turn them into reality without having to take a lot of steps that might restrict your vision or prevent you realizing it. The world of metabolic hormones is full of challenges. Today there are dozens of hormones we had never heard of 20 years ago. They regulate the metabolism of sugars and fats. For example, leptin, a hormone derived from fat cells that inhibits appetite, or ghrelin, a gastric hormone that stimulates it. But how exactly do these hormones work, and how strong are they? In mice, the genes that are responsible for the production of appetite hormones can be switched on and off. If we switch off the gene and put the mouse on a McDonald's diet, and we see that it maybe ingests less of it, then we know that the natural function of this signal in the mouse really is related to the regulation of appetite. Brainstorming with colleagues. Given the complexity of metabolic mechanisms, you need to have a clear strategy if your research is to be successful. How can the young international research group work together successfully? Matthias Chöp shares his experience as a medical researcher. His Alexander von Humboldt professorship has brought together the Helmholtz Research Center in Munich and the Technische Universität München. The big advantage is that there is much more communication between scientists and students on both levels, driven by the really fascinating research field of diabetes. This area is actually so under-researched that it attracts a lot of interest amongst young academics, if it is headed by someone as excellent as Professor Chirp. One of my main tasks is to combine our own research results from the lab, under the microscope, using certain genetic methods, with the findings of other research centers across the world, maybe on the very same day they are made. Then I have to evaluate our own data, write publications, attend conferences, congresses and mini-symposia, or communicate by Skype or iPhone. That's the daily round and every minute counts if you want to keep up. In the lab at Helmholtz Research Center, this is where the cell cultures of genetically modified mice are prepared. It is now possible to simulate the behavior of all organ cells that are relevant to the metabolism in vitro. What is the impact of a fatty diet on fat cells, for example? To discover the answer, a variety of nutrient solutions are applied to genetically different fat cell populations. After a time, they are checked to see how many calories the cells have burned up. 
The result is that the mitochondria, the power plants of many of the cells, are unable to process the flood of nutrients. In an obesity model, for example, we see that the structure and function of these little cell power plants change quite noticeably if too many fatty acids are present. If the fat cells have become too large, the cell's power plant stops functioning altogether and makes everything even worse because the fatty acids that are stored and the calories that are stored can no longer be burned up. The cells in the body's periphery become diseased. But what happens to the central organ that controls metabolism, the brain? Why doesn't it do anything about it? Chirp's team made a surprising discovery in the mouse brain. If the mouse is on a high-fat diet, the brain structure changes in a very short time. At particularly sensitive points, where nutrients are recognized, tissue inflammation occurs. This really does seem to lead to structural changes. New vessels develop, new cell formations. It's our impression that these may be processes that can destroy and even irreversibly modify important controlling systems. Anti-inflammatory drugs may be an answer, but it will be better to prevent an excessive ingestion of nutrients in the first place. With a combination of natural messengers, the brain can be duped into believing that we're full. The appetite suppressant works for the mouse. Now Professor Chup wants to develop one for people. My dream would be to use the signaling pathways we're currently identifying and that we're just beginning to discover how they work to develop a pattern, a combination that can influence the central control of our sugar metabolism in the brain so effectively that we could prevent or heal diseases like obesity or type 2 diabetes.